Hello and welcome to Access Chat. I'm very, very pleased to welcome Paul Carter today. Um, I'm a long-term viewer and fan of BBC Click, which is the programme that Paul is a journalist on and uh, also helps produce. Uh, it's been running 20 years um, and is on BBC News or BBC Worldwide if you're outside of the UK. So, um, And one of the reasons I like it is because it features all kinds of technology, including inclusive technologies. So welcome, Paul. It's great to have you. And you know what? We're pretty much replicating the new 2021 Click Studio here um, <laughs> by doing this from home. So well, thanks, thanks for having me. It's, it's a it's a pleasure. I'm I'm honoured to have been to have been asked to do it. But yeah, you're right. This is a it's kind of the new normal, isn't it, to be broadcasting from home? Yes. Although I, I did see the sort of home broadcast kit that you had on on the show the other day, which was fifty grand's worth of kit in flight cases and, and everything else with all of the breakout lights and everything. Well, I have to say, Spencer and Lara, the uh, the, the main presenters of our program, um, you know, they have a they have full proper studio setups in, in the house as, as you can see mine's mine's not much of a backdrop so uh, yeah i drew the short straw no no fancy lights and cameras for me uh, and, and and likewise for me you know um it is real plant it's not plastic um but but other than that yes absolutely um i think everybody's now doing video from home we're getting to see the insides of people's houses which is interesting some interesting ones on newsnight by the way <laughs> oh my goodness! You didn't tidy up. Do you know what? It, it, it is a still a source of mystery to me that we're what nearly a year into this and people still haven't worked out to not have their laptops pointing directly up their nostrils. It's uh, slightly interesting. Put your put your webcams on books, people. Come on. Yes. <laughs> so um, for for those of the, um, our, our viewers that don't know can you tell us a little bit more about click and, and and what you do and and also sort of some of the stuff that you feature that's exciting sure i mean i'll give you the um i'll give you the official kind of spiel first of all if you like i mean click is the bbc's flagship technology program as you say we're brought broadcast on bbc news in the uk um bbc one on weekend mornings uh, and worldwide on bbc world uh, we've got a reach of about 300 million uh, and our weekly viewership is about 80 million worldwide. So it's, um, it's pretty big. I tend not to tell interviewees that before we speak to them, because sometimes that makes them very nervous. Um, we are also we also go out and you might see us sometimes on um, airlines. Well, not so much at the moment, but if you know, on your in-flight entertainment, cruise ships, things like that. Um, editorially, we cover the whole gamut of technology. Um, I do always say to people, we're not a consumer technology program specifically. So, um, you know, we're not strictly about, oh, this is the best television to buy, or um, there's a new phone out this week. You know, we might, we might nod toward those if they were particularly relevant or interesting, but that's not our sole kind of remit. We are first and foremost a current affairs program. So it's, it's technology related to current affairs um, and how that kind of ties in to broader themes such as artificial intelligence, cyber warfare, all of that kind of thing and everything everything in between. I always like to think of Click as being about how does technology change the world? That's always the way that I would describe it to other people. Um, and then, yeah, outside of that, we uh, are translated uh, into, I think at last count, 17 different languages um, and it's available in over 200 countries um, and growing. So. Yeah, and in terms of accessibility and, and things like that, we um, we cover accessibility a lot. It's gone up since I became involved in the show, but um, I should stress that the program covered accessibility long before I came along. Uh, I produce a episode of the show every year to tie in with the, I always have to think about this before I say it, International Day of Persons with Disabilities. Um, but also, I'm very keen to stress that we don't just do one show that's just about disability each year. We do disability and accessibility stuff all year round. We just happen to do one show a year, which we unashamedly devote just to that subject. Yeah. Spiel over. Great. And, 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 and yeah, I, I, I can back you up as, as a regular viewer. There's always, you know, quite frequently there are segments on and, 
um, things that are sort of inclusive and talking about sort of impact on humanity of, of tech. Uh, so I always enjoy getting a fix of, of people trying jetpacks and self-driving cars and, and, and all of this stuff, but also the sort of also the sort of analysis of what's going on on the web and it's it's really eclectic and i think that's one of the reasons i i enjoy it so much because you don't necessarily know what you're going to get from week to week and, and to be honest it's it's such an incredible beat to work because by the very nature of what we're covering there is always something new there's always something yeah. happening there's always something exciting and i think even more so nowadays it's an area that impacts and and kind of reaches into into everyday lives much more than it than it used to before you know um technology is is part of all of our lives now just in terms of everything that we do throughout throughout the day more so than it was 10 years ago more so than it was 10 years before that so um yeah it's it's never dull that's for sure so deborah you're yes you're coming off me great yeah yeah, thank you. And welcome to the program, Paul. I I have not seen Click, and so I'm definitely going to make sure that I go out and look at it because I'm a big fan of BBC. But I also applaud BBC for um, bringing you in because you obviously are very talented, but at the same point, you are also are have a lived experience of disabilities. And so I love that um, that you are there you know, just, just by you being there talking about these topics, you, you cause inclusion. So um, I, I, we, we don't see that as much in the United States. And so I, I see it more in the United Kingdom. And I, I appreciate the United Kingdom for that. And certainly BBC, we are huge fans of BBC in the United States. Uh, so many of my friends, we all prefer BBC over um, some of our uh, news medias, and I won't say the names, but y'all know who they are. But I, I just like BBC because it, the richness of the content, but I also like that BBC really focuses uh, on having um, people that have lived experiences of different segments, because I just think that's so powerful. So I would be curious, Paul, how did you get involved? I know you said it's been 20 years, which is amazing, but how did you get involved in this? Because, um, you know, it's a very successful program and obviously you're a very talented producer, but I was just wondering how it came about. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, but just, just before I get onto that, I, I, you know, I do kind of want to, want to caveat that just because I do tend to cover all of our accessibility and, and kind of disability related stuff, that's not just what I do. I, yeah. I, I cover, I cover absolutely everything on, on the show as well as as well as disability and accessibility stuff it's not necessarily just oh we've got an access story let's wheel Paul out that's not um oh my that's, that's no not, that's not a it, great point that, that's, that's not how it goes so, um, so that's good yeah. but I mean in terms in terms of my background I mean I've 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 been at the BBC on and off for sort of around 10 years I I trained as a journalist I worked in print for a number of years um for a disability publication um and then at a couple of consumer magazines and then I moved across into um, into television and worked at a couple of independent production companies um, and joined um, the BBC uh, again a few years ago to work on a program called Newsnight, which is our uh, kind of flagship evening political news program, I guess you'd call it. Um, and yes, it, I've, I've worked in TV and in, and in radio and I joined Click, uh, I'm just trying to think of my days now, um about about three and a half years ago so i've been on the program for about the last three and a half years so yeah i've kind of had a roundabout route to get where i am but um i'm, I'm pleased where i've ended up and you know you bring up such a good point because one thing that we see in the united states just speaking from the lens of the us right now we will take uh people with disabilities and they only can work in the disability field and it's ridiculous because, you know, that we are people, so we have a lot to add. So I think that's a real, I think it's great that you're talking about accessibility and disability inclusion, but I think it's even more powerful that you are not talking about that. You're talking about technology. So I, I think we need to continue to change um, the, you know, the dialogue. And I think you're a perfect example of, you know, somebody that's very talented that anyone would be lucky to be working with. and you know, you did the steps, you know, that led to this success. So kudos to you and once again, the BBC. 
<laughs> so, so thank I, you. If, if I can come in on that, I think that, that actually there's, you know, yes, the, the corporation does a good job. You know, you're you're one of many represented in mainstream roles in front of camera. I'm, I'm also, you know, uh, particularly like our, you know, Gary O'Donoghue in terms of political correspondent, you know, mainstream role. You know, Gary's amazing because Gary does all of his video edits and he's a JAWS user. So, you know, Gary's fantastic, but, but, but more to the point, he's doing a mainstream you know, role and it's not disability focused. So it's, it's like you say, it's, you know, it's representation as part of the, the wider organization that's interesting. I'm also interested in the behind camera stuff because actually, you know, it's great to have people in front of camera, but there also needs to be that uh, opportunity to work behind camera making the decisions because that also impacts totally. representation so as a producer you know what are the sort of steps being taken you know or do you think are important to take to be inclusive because obviously you know you can have obvious disabilities but there's also lots of hidden disabilities as well and how can we make the best of of um of our opportunities to to lead and include through some of the behind camera roles yeah, I mean, it's it, you're totally right, and it's a it's a big question because uh, there's there's not just one there's not just one easy easy solution. I mean, there there are several ways you know to tackle it. I think that whole thing about on screen representation is is a big one because I think a lot does does come from that in terms of you know I, I mean I, I hate to use the word kind of inspiration and I don't I don't mean it in the kind of the term that it's that it's come to be to be laden as but um, you know, people often say to me 20 years ago, they didn't see other disabled people on television doing doing mainstream roles. So I, I, I do think that that does have a benefit. But I think in terms of the the sort of softer power, if you like, it, it, it is about getting more people involved behind the camera because, you know, the whole ethos of nothing about us without us is is especially important in in television. And where I think that that's most critical is actually in story selection. And it's about getting disabled people telling the stories that are important to us and to our lives and to our communities and not the stories that non-disabled people think are important to disabled people. And that's a subtle change, but I think that's really important. And, you know, that's that's come to pass on 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 the program that I work on, certainly, because people have come to me and said, hey, we, what do you think of this? And I would say, no, absolutely not. We're not doing that. Um, but, and, you know, I always caveat it with X, Y and Z, and that, that's why we shouldn't be doing that type of story or whatever. But I mean, you know, e even now you, you, you will see stories that are out there. And I'm not just talking about the BBC, I'm talking generally. And you can tell straight away that there were no disabled people involved in the production of that content. Um, and because you know that if there were, it never would have been made. Um, and to get to that point, I think, is, is critical. And how we do that, I mean, you know, that's it's a big question. There's a lot to do around pipeline in to the media for people. So that's, you know, recruitment, training, all of that. Retention, which is, a, which is the big one that's often forgotten about. It's great getting people in on schemes, but it's then about actually keeping those people within your organization and allowing them to grow and to move upwards and to actually get to those leadership positions where they can, where they can make those decisions and promotion. And, you know, and then I think also for people like me, it's enabling other people, it's create, it's building bridges behind you and throwing ladders down, if I can use those terrible cliches, you know. Um, it's, I see it as my responsibility to give opportunities to other young disabled reporters to get on screen, to other producers to come and tell their stories. So, you know, there's not one, there's not one magic bullet. It's it's fighting on a on a on a number of fronts. And it's not something that's going to change overnight. As an organization, is the BBC doing well? I think, yes, absolutely. Could we do better? hundred percent. Yeah. I think I think that's fair. And I I, I was lucky enough to be uh, able to take a course sponsored by the BBC and the Media Trust which was looking at um, giving media skills to uh, disabled people to be expert interviewees. So, so I think that that's another element where quite often, you know, we'll have the same speaking, talking heads brought onto the news programs all the time. And, and, and actually there's, 
less of a diversity in guests. And I think that this that initiative was also really interesting because, you know, and it's not just BBC, all news programmes end up wheeling out the same commentators all of the time. So, so I think that this was a really uh, nice initiative where it was training people in academia or who, who have some kind of expertise how to, to deal with interviews, how to you know, look at the camera, sit still, which I'm failing to do right now. Um, you know, it's harder with a webcam, it has to be said. Yeah. yeah um, and, and actually, that leads on to my next question, which is actually how has broadcasting adjusted in times of COVID? And we've already talked a little bit about doing it from home, but how, how, how difficult is it now to produce programs when everyone is distributed? Yeah, it was something that we basically learned on the job. Um, when the kind of the original lockdown hit, you know, here in the UK in, in March last year, no one really from the from the um, from the channel came to us and said, you know, you're coming off air. So we were just we basically took the decision among ourselves that we're going to do, you know, the best we can, the best we can do. And we knew that obviously it was going to change the way the way we work. And to be honest with you, there was no um, there was no magic master plan. We just kind of rolled with it and saw what worked and what didn't work and kind of tweaked little bits as as and when we as and when we went. And, you know, I mean, I think in, in those early days, we, we did have to do things very, very differently because we weren't able to get out and film anything at all, which was kind of a culture shock for us because we're a, as I've said before, we're a global program. Um, you know, we travel all over the world to film our content. Um, and then suddenly to not only not be able to leave the country, but to not be able to leave your own home was a bit of a, a, a reversal for us in, in how we did things. So it was um, basically making use of the best of what we had. So platforms platforms like Zoom um, to interview our guests, um, using a lot of create, creative kind of tricks and tools that we had, you know, m maybe getting people to film stuff remotely for us on, on their phones or or whatever, just anything we could do to try and break up the kind of monotony of it just being people talking on Zoom. Um, I like to think we did pretty well at it. Um, it seemed to go down pretty well. Um, obviously, can't wait to actually get back out and be doing stuff in person again. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it's been it's been a challenge for everyone. Everyone has has had to learn to do everything differently, and we're we're no we're no different to that, and certainly not certainly not complaining you know we just we just had to get on with it um and i think i think we've done okay um we were lucky enough that when things opened up a little bit for the halcyon days of summer we were able to get out and, and do some stuff in the in the flesh again and sort of fill the fill the shelves with some content so we weren't we weren't completely back to square one um so yeah it's um I, I'd say even now, what nine months in, we're still we're still learning, we're still tweaking it, we're still trying new things. But if anything, it's kind of given us a bit more. I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't go as far as to say it's been a blessing or anything like that. But it is kind of to a degree has given you a little bit of creative freedom because it's been like, okay, well we'll try this, um, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It's um, yeah, it uh, it's been a, it's been a challenge, but we're we're tackling it, I guess. <laughs> Paul, Paul, along that same line, what, what do you think you're going to keep from what you learned about COVID nine, from the lessons you learned with COVID nineteen? What do you, what, what do you think that y'all think? Oh, well, it works much better now this way. I mean, were there any real valuable lessons learned? Or and once again, I know that's still unfolding, but. I mean, I think on, on, a, on a sort of wider perspective, obviously, the, the whole nature of working remotely, it, it's something that, you know, if you'd have asked us a year ago whether we could make nine months worth of content without seeing each other, I'd have thought, you know, I would, I would have laughed at you. Um, and we've been doing that for nine months. And I, so I, I absolutely think there will be elements of that that we, that we take forward that it's going to reduce things like, and, and this doesn't just apply to us or, or to the television. I think this is, this applies to everybody. I, I think um, the whole concept of presenteeism and things like that will, will, will definitely reduce because of this. 
um, and that has plays as big plays as well into um, access issues, by the way. Um, but in terms of, you know, in terms of us specifically, I think that the whole notion that we don't necessarily have to be on the other side of the planet to see stuff or to, or to, to bring stuff to life on screen is, is interesting. Um, and, and probably something that I, I would I would say that it's probably going to raise the bar slightly for us in terms of having to travel and go and go and do things. Obviously, we, we still will do that, um, but I, th I think perhaps we we might think about doing that a little bit harder than we perhaps would have done before. And so, obviously, that has a positive sustainability impact because your carbon footprint is going to be somewhat less. But what do you think that this will have an impact also on on sort of studios and, and longer term as well? You know, will it give, you know, for example, you, know, you, you mentioned in terms of, um, you know, access implications already. Do you think it will open up opportunities for um, journalists more with disabilities where they maybe have mobility issues that would have been um, maybe the expectations were you have to travel everywhere in order to report? For example, do you think that will that there'll be that impact? And do you think also the 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 fact that we've got used to citizen journalism and and like slightly untidy and unkempt backgrounds and everything else um, change our expectations for for and need for studios and stuff like that? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, I hope so. I I absolutely hope that's what that's what happens. I'm. I'm I've been in the game long enough that I'm not going to sit here and say, yes, we're, we're, we're never going to go back to the way we used to make things 18 months ago, because, you know, who, who knows, how, who knows how the world works. I, I really, really hope so. And it's, I think it's everyone's responsibility to take the good things that have come out of this, what, what few good things there may be, but to, to take those and to, and to take those forward. Um, I think, you know, one of the interesting things you mentioned there about the whole concept of, People are much more forgiving about dodgy backgrounds and 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 all of that. I, I do think that's a really interesting point, and that's something that we learn very quickly in this. Is that if you can, you know, understand what someone is what someone is saying, and you can you can get the gist of what's coming across. People aren't that bothered about what it looks like. Um, one of the really interesting things that we learned quite early on in, re in recording Zoom interviews, this, this might be a boring people, boring thing for people who don't work in TV, but we actually got the people we were interviewing to record their sound on their, um, on their mobile phone or, or any device that they had locally to them at the same time as doing the Zoom interview and then sent us the, the audio file afterwards because we realised pretty early on, you know, if people's internet drops or whatever and, and the picture goes blocky, that doesn't really matter as long as you can still understand what what those what that person's saying um and it's just little things like that that again you know we probably wouldn't have even considered so um yeah I, in terms of the whole thing of, about studios and and will it improve access for for disabled people getting on the app i really hope so and hopefully those days of oh you know well if you can't get into a isdn point we can't have you on the air Hopefully those days are gone. Um, but like I say, it, I think it's going to be very easy. I think what will be surprising will be how quickly all of this is forgotten once things get back to normal. I know normal may seem a long way off now, but um, and I think it's everyone's, it's everyone's responsibility, particularly when it comes to things like access to remember that Things are things have been possible now that we wouldn't have thought were possible eighteen months ago. Well, uh, one of the, uh, we have guests in the past and we have discussed about uh, the representation of people with disabilities within media, okay? and uh, and even if we look today across you know, all the different mediums uh, around Europe, programs and shows, you know, it's not really flattering uh, in, in terms of what we see in terms of, uh, you know. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm really to hear you. Can you hear me? That's, That's better, better. Yeah. yes. Okay. You're break. Yeah, that is better. Okay, so we have been, we had guests in the past where we discussed about representation in media. Okay. And uh, what do you think we, we need to do in order to have more, to, to have people more visible? Because 
Uh, if we look around Europe, different media outlets, uh, there's still a lot to do. You know, people are still uh, doing, are not really represented as they should. So how can we progress faster? I think it's it's an interesting question. It's it's a two sided it's a two sided thing, right? You've got to first of all, the first big challenge is you've got to convince these organisations that are responsible for increasing that representation. You've got to make them think that it's some it's a cause, not a cause. That's not the right word, but it's something that they should be doing, right? That's that's the big organisational institutional challenge. Um, you you have to show broadcasters why it's important to them to be putting disabled people on screen, right? That's the, that's the first challenge. They've got to realize that there is a business case and that they should be representing their audiences. Um, and then I think the second point flows from that and, and it kind of goes back to, to the whole issue of having people on screen that then shows other people that this is, this is a career for me. This is, this is something that, that I can do and providing opportunities for those people to have roots in to that industry. I think the media has got very good, certainly in the UK, at running um, schemes and apprenticeship programs and recruitment drives around increasing disability representation. There's a long way to go on moving beyond that because I think we've done, we've done a very good job at getting people in on the ground floor. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, as I mentioned, where you take that with with retention and promotion and things like that that's that's the next stage beyond that but i think for countries broadcasters other other areas of industries that aren't at that level yet you need to make those people with the decision making powers realize that this is something that they absolutely have to be doing that's a bigger challenge but i think there are lots and lots of moves afoot to, to kind of show that there is a business case out there for increasing representation and increasing accessibility. And if I can make one third point from that, the that link between representation and accessibility is really important as well, because it's no good having a desire to bring more disabled people into your industry if your industry isn't accessible to them. I, I think that, that those are really good points because yeah. you, you can't do these things one thing at a time. There has to be this sort of interwoven approach because accessibility is the enabler to, for people to be able to perform uh, at the level of their, you know, of their potential. So, you know, it's, it's great that you give someone a job, but if they can't then do that job, then they're going to fail and, and, and that's going to, you know, have, have implications. So the the technology as the enabler, as well as the policies and the recruitment and everything else is is the thing that will help people progress. Um, thinking about technology, because Click is about technology, what are the technologies that are really exciting you right now, um, generally, and then also in terms of, you know, with, with uh, potential to include people? I mean, obviously the, the, the big stuff around is is everything around artificial intelligence it's a bit of a hill that i will die on at the moment that everyone is calling everything ai when it isn't ai um that drives me absolutely bonkers um but i think you know tr true ai has has lots of um access implications and, and possibilities and and a lot of the big Tech companies are cottoning onto that. Mm -hmm. Microsoft, for example, have um, have got an AI for accessibility grants program, and they're funding a lot of businesses that are looking to use artificial intelligence in um, accessibility applications. I featured one of them, one of their grant recipients, in our last um, accessibility special, and it's uh, using AI for object recognition um, for blind and visually impaired people, because there are lots of data sets out there at the moment. For object recognition, Ob object recognition isn't new, um, but there are very little data sets that exist out there for objects that are of specific use to blind and visually impaired people. Um, and so Microsoft are fund funding a research project to try and uh, to, to build up those kind of those kind of databases. And that's just one example. There are you know dozens out there. So I think I think AI has has huge implications. The other interesting thing, and, and I and I mention this as both a kind of real positive thing but also kind of a negative is is vr 
Um, I think virtual reality and uh, augmented reality as well have huge potential on one hand for accessibility and, and for disabled people, but at the same time, they are throwing up a huge number of issues around accessibility. Um, I've got a, um, an Oculus Quest headset. Um, I can't use the controllers because I don't have hands and the, they are very, very specifically designed for hands because they fit around your wrist and you use your fingers to press the buttons. Um, it has hand tracking built in, so you don't have to use the controllers. Obviously, hand tracking doesn't work for me. So therefore, a lot of the programs and the software that runs on that platform is designed to be used specifically with those controllers, so I can't use it. Um, so that's a kind of a real conundrum. And it, in a way, it's part of the accessibility and inclu inclusive tech kind of debate, if you like, that I absolutely love because with all of these great new developments and, and progress we make in one area, it throws up a whole host of accessibility issues on, on the other hand. And it's it's fascinating to me. And, and where we will go with that is, you know, who knows? I'm, I'm looking at a, a project at the minute that is um, quite close to me, that it's a group of researchers are looking at, um, hand tracking and input for, for devices for people that don't have that don't have hands or or might have paralysis so that kind of stuff is really is really interesting the whole i think the the next kind of great battlefront of of accessibility is going to be around ux i think that's going to be a really interesting um area so those are the two sort of big things i'm i'm really interested in the other is the other thing that everyone really talks about is, is obviously driverless cars i'm I'm, a, I'm an autonomous vehicle skeptic. I think a lot of the industry is built on hype. Um, but again, it's kind of a bit of a unicorn for disabled people, right? Because if they were to become a reality tomorrow, how brilliant would that be for, for disabled people everywhere that they could get in a car outside and, and take it to where they want to go? Um, but I think we're miles off that yet, despite what the... Uh, despite what the autonomous lobby will tell you. They're all going to be banging down my door now to have a go at me. But yeah, those are those are kind of the three the three big areas for me. Um, but there are lots of other interesting things yeah. bubbling under as well. No, I think that's I think that's excellent. And 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 you're right about the the challenges of new technologies, you know, throwing up new accessibility questions. And and that's one of the exciting things about working in the field is that you get to again explore new new things and 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 solve new problems again so um thank you very much we've reached the end of our allotted time need to thank our friends and supporters barclays access my clear text and microlink for helping keep us going after all this time and um really look forward to you joining us on twitter absolute thank pleasure thanks for having me